Good morning. Today we are going to talk to Prof. Tanya Notarius from the Department of Hebrew. Welcome, Prof. Nice to meet you. Hello. Uh, Prof, can you tell us how did you become a researcher? Uh, so, uh, I always was very fascinated about languages and literature and always read a lot. And. Um, uh, for my first and second degree, I studied philology, and philology is actually languages and literature together. So I studied it in Moscow and then in Germany, and uh, uh, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, I studied my PhD uh, about uh, Hebrew poetry, about the language of Hebrew poetry. And uh, uh, PhD is actually a lot of work, it took me in different uh, directions, and I had to learn more languages and study a lot of linguistics, and uh, do things like this, uh, but it's also always fascinated me to understand something. So I always say to my uh, children and to my students, my uh, favorite research method is to think. Yeah, so when you think and you really concentrate on certain topic, sometimes all of a sudden you have insights, all of a sudden you understood something that probably nobody else before you <laughs> uh, had understood. And that's really fascinated me. I like this feeling, and um, I continue working. My first paper, for example, that I wrote was not accepted for publications. Publication at the beginning, I didn't give up. I continue. I resend it, and today I author a lot of uh, papers uh, and a book. Working on my second book, so it's really part of my life. Thank you so much, Pro. And then, what are you currently working on? So now I work on my second full scope book. It will be called um, uh, uh, Studies, or something like this, Studies in Historical Syntax of uh, Ugaritic Language. So Ugaritic Language is uh, also Semitic language, which is quite close to Hebrew, but it is more ancient than Hebrew. And the study of Ugaritic language gives us really a very interesting insight into the history of this group of Semitic languages to which Hebrew also belongs. And um, I'm, in general, I'm very much interested in historical linguistics. I like to see how languages are changing, that you change through ages, how languages are developing. That really is very interesting for me. So, I work on this. It's one of my projects. My another project is connected to epigraphy. Epigraphy is the ancient writings that were found in uh, archaeological excavations. So alphabetic writings in Hebrew or in Aramaic. So I have also project uh, about such types of uh, writing, of epigra epigraphy, Aramaic epigraphy. Yes, Prof. When you talk about linguistic. Yes. Can you take us or give us an explanation on linguistic difference between the prose and the poetry in Hebrew language? Yes, so prose and poetry in Hebrew. That was actually the topic of my dissertation and then I also wrote about it and published about it. So in general I do very much like poetry. I believe really poetry, poetry is verbal art of, verbal art of uh, uh, people and poetry is very, very strong. And so po the language of poetry is on one hand uh, very, uh, sometimes very conservative, archaic, conventional. In this sense it is different from everyday language of our everyday communication. On the other hand, it is very creative, very uh, strong. It's really verbal arts. Yeah? So we uh, create uh, pieces of art with, with language. That's what poetry is about. And I try to understand why the language of prose and the language of poetry are commonly so different. So, on one, so what's the reason for this? How can we describe it and how we can explain this? So either the language of poetry is more archaic, is more ancient, or vice versa, the language of poetry is more innovative, is more creative. Yeah. So we, I see here certain uh, drama, certain research question, 
And that's what I study for Hebrew and also for Ugaritic. Ugaritic also has uh, poetry and prose language, and it is uh, also uh, very interesting. Thank you so much, Prof. And then, are there any exciting gaps within your, your field? Yeah, I think there are like there are mostly gaps, gaps, sorry, mostly gaps, because when you work with ancient languages, you just work with very small pieces of information. We don't have the whole picture because most of the data are lost. Uh, imagine a puzzle, yeah, a puzzle of I don't know a thousand pieces, and you have to only twenty. Yeah, so you try to uh, kind of collect the whole picture using 20 pieces, but you want to understand what was the whole picture, what was the whole uh, puzzle. So that's how we work in ancient languages. We just uh, collect uh, small pieces of information and um, analyzing them, trying to understand what could be the general uh, picture. So for Hebrew, for example, uh, the great question is uh, how Hebrew Bible was written, yeah? uh, at what time, uh, what are the stages of creating this corpus, because Hebrew Bible, uh, Bible uh, in Hebrew language, that's the collection of books, yeah? there are many books in it, several books, and we want to understand how uh, this process uh, occurred, also uh, how we can follow within Hebrew Bible different layers of Hebrew, because we say that Hebrew Bible was written during a thousand years. So the most ancient text, it's maybe 12th century uh, BC. And the newest text is 3rd century BC. So it's almost 12 years of uh, the span of writing, how it developed. So there are a lot of questions here. Yeah, so <laughs> keep us busy. Okay. Thank you so much, Prof. And then concerning the dialect. Is there a difference between ancient and modern Hebrew? Yes, yes, of course, of course. Yes. So I'm a scholar of ancient Hebrew, but I also know modern Hebrew. It's one of my uh, languages, and um, there is difference. But at the same time, uh, maybe you know that modern Hebrew was actually revived based on classical Hebrew. So the uh, further generation, uh, the uh, earlier generations of uh, scholars, they took classical Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, and they started to talk, to revive the speech in Hebrew, and that's how modern Hebrew appeared. So still, um, modern and uh, classical Hebrew share a, a lot, yeah? morphology, the structure of word, and many other things, but there are some differences, some words are different, the, the structure of sentence, but still for students of Biblical Hebrew, it helps a lot to know also modern Hebrew. It helps a lot that these two types of knowledge complement each other. Thank you so much, Prof. And then can you take us through the accent in Hebrew? In Biblical Hebrew. In Biblical Hebrew, In Biblical yes. Hebrew, okay. So that's a long story. <laughs> Because Hebrew was transmitted in Jewish communities. Uh, so Jewish communities were reading a uh, Bible in Hebrew uh, on Saturday, on Shabbat, and on feasts, and were studying it all the time. Yeah, so that's how Hebrew was transmitted. And uh, as you might know, there were different communities in different places. So they started to pronounce it differently. So the community in uh, Iraq pronounced one way. The community in uh, uh, Spain and then in Arabic countries pronounced different way. The community in Europe, they pronounced in another way. Then there was a very important community in Yemen, south um, of Arabian Peninsula. They had their own accent. So there were really different accents of Hebrew. And then when Europeans, European scholars, started to study Hebrew and to turn it into modern European field, they had to decide what accent to choose. So they decided that the best accent is the accent of Oriental uh, community, so-called Sephardic accent, the accent that was used in Spain and then in Northern Africa. So they adopted it. And that's the way we pronounce today modern Hebrew as well, and that's the way we also read Biblical mostly. Uh, although some other accents are still relevant, are still uh, used by, by some people. And then, thank you, Prof. 
And then how do you explain a verb in Hebrew? Verb? The, yeah, verb, yeah. Verb is, uh, I have written a lot about verbal syntax. Verb is very important for grammar in general, for any language. So verb is a kind of word that is in the core of the sentence. Yeah? So it's really a word that collects all other words together. That's why uh, the syntax and the semantics of verbs is uh, so important. So Hebrew has some special uh, Biblical Hebrew, some some special um, features, some special characteristics. We have the system of stems, and we have the system uh, the system of stems, which is very developed, and then we have the system of tenses, which is not so developed. Yeah, each language has its um, uh, special uh, peculiarities, and um, that's the art of us as professors of Hebrew to explain it to other students, to the students who just start to study Hebrew, to explain it in the most simple and clear way, not to frighten them. Because people are sometimes afraid of Hebrew. Oh, Hebrew is so difficult. No, it is not. It very much depends how you teach, how you uh, explain the uh, small things, how you train uh, the language with the, uh, with the students. So it's not very difficult. And that's why I very much encourage people to, to study Hebrew. It's a good uh, subject, good discipline, and uh, it develops your mind, takes you into the world of Bible. Yes. Thank you, Prof. And then when I talk about mem. Mem? Yes. What do you mean? It's M-E-M. Is it in Hebrew? Hebrew? In Hebrew. In Hebrew. It's, a, it's a letter. Okay, yes. <laughs> yes, why? So uh, how do you explain that letter? Letter. Yeah. I just wrote it on the board. It has two writings. The writing in the middle of the word and then the writing at the end of the word. So we have two different writings for this uh, letter. It's a very common letter. So why does it have two, two writings? Two writing? uh, look, we have six letters that have two writings. And I will tell you the truth, it's not so bad. Because if you go to Arabic, Arabic has much more letters that have different writings. And Arabic, for example, you can have different writing at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of the word. So in Hebrew it's easier. <laughs> it's okay. only six letters and only middle uh, and at the end of the word. So it has to do with the history of uh, writing. Simply, they, these are letters that they had long lag. And then the people started to connect this leg to the next letter. And that's how they another type of writing appeared, the writing which is in the middle of the word. But uh, when you come to my Hebrew class, I will explain with more details. Thank you, Prof. You're and then, welcome. what message can you share with aspiring researcher? With aspiring researcher? Look, um, I have several things that I kind of repeat to myself. Yeah, I, I, I learned it from my father. Uh, blessed memory and for my teachers. Uh, I had very good teachers during my life. I uh, was blessed with this. Uh, so one of the things that I kind of remind myself all the time uh, that we human, uh, human beings, um, we are distinguished by the fact that we create knowledge, we collect knowledge, and we transmit knowledge. Yeah, that's part of our uh, strength. Yeah, that also what makes us human. So for us, as the people of humanities, or the people of, uh, of our scholars, that's our job actually, to create knowledge, to collect knowledge, and to transmit knowledge to uh, further generations. So I see it as a kind, kind, of my, um, kind of my mission, and I think that's very important, and I would like more people also to, to be involved in this, in different types of knowledge, but also in what is connected to Hebrew or to, to Bible. The other thing that I always remind myself that um, a person with, even a person with average abilities can do a lot. You don't have to be genius. Even a person with ever, average abilities can uh, achieve a lot of things. If everything, almost everything. If you are consistent, if you work hard, if you are passionate about what you're doing, you don't, you don't, you never underestimate 
your intellectual abilities. Never. Yeah. So always believe in what you have is is for good. Yeah. You can do the best of this. And my third mail message is a bit harsh. <laughs> I heard it with, when I was first year student. I heard it from my professor of uh, Spanish language, and she said something like. Get appalled by your ignorance and start to work. So it's a bit harsh. Not everyone. It's not so maybe not so accepted for modern students. But sometimes I reminded myself, and I can also mention it to to my students. It's not so bad to be appalled, to be kind of horrified by your ignorance, because there are a lot of things that we don't know. And then if it encourages us to continue working, we. Uh, go on and uh, have some interesting things to achieve and to uh, see forward to. Yes. Thanks, Prof. And then coming back to your work, is there a specific theory or school of thought that influence your writing? Um, uh, that's a good question. So uh, I think I was influenced by, uh, I'm a linguist, but I'm also a philologist. So what's the difference? Uh, linguistics is interested in language as a system, as a system of science. science. And philology is interested in texts, uh, in the text, how, uh, how texts make sense, yeah? how we interpret text, what, what information can we draw from text. That's the difference. But they are, of course, connected. Yeah? Linguistics and philology are connected. So in linguistics, we have a lot of theories. Linguistics is very much about framework, yeah? So you have to choose your framework. Again, one of my teachers, uh, she also, also passed away, unfortunately, Professor Nadine Theron from Hebrew University, she was very fluent in several linguistic theories. She was very prominent linguist. And she once told me, you know what, framework is not important. What is important is what you can do with this framework. Framework is a tool to get your knowledge, to create knowledge, to understand something, to describe something in the most logical and consistent way. That's the way I see it. So I learn from different frameworks. I combine different frameworks in my work. I try to be consistent and logical and uh, uh, make good, strict uh, scholarship. But I can't say that I'm just uh, kind of uh, obsessive about one approach. No, I'm not. As I said, my best, my favorite approach is to think. <laughs> Thank you so much, bro. No, okay. And then, apart from research, what are your other interests? I'm a mom. Um, I have family. I'm married, and I have four kids. As part of my kids are already grown up, my older daughter is uh, married, but uh, still I want to spend as much time as possible with my family, with uh, my husband, with my kids, uh, just to sit and chat with them, to do things together, to read books, to travel. Uh, that's actually what I do when I'm not busy with my work. <laughs> Most, yes. uh, thank you so much for your time, Pro. Yeah, we really appreciate you sharing uh, with us and thank you for having me here thank you